words on Norman's book that has been released, which is even this I get to experience, thinking even I get to experience this, which is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> Shameless promoter, but that's okay. And you were all going to get an opportunity to, <laughs> to, to purchase the book and have Norman sign it. That's going to be afterwards in the pavilion. I'll remind you of that when this is all over. But you, you saw in the program this is billed as uh, an unexpected intersection, a conversation with Norman Lear and uh, Prophet Walker. And I should add that I'm Alex Wood. I work with MSNBC. I'm an anchor there. And I'm really, really happy to be here. But this conversation is extremely special. It is something that will talk about this unexpected intersection of these two men's lives from very different backgrounds, very different stages in life, very different accomplishments. And yet, what can happen, really a, a sort of a magic that happens as these two men crossed paths. So first, for those of you who haven't been anywhere near a television for the last four and a half decades, we're going to just roll a little bit of an introduction to give you just a small sampling of what this man is all about and what he's accomplished. Here's that. Boy, don't say that. Oh, no. Miller, you watch yourself. <laughs> songs that made. Well, I guess we could all sing that. <laughs> we could actually do it in unison, but. This doesn't happen in any part of the country. Right. Just here in Hollywood. Exactly. Age when broadcast TV was king, the king of broadcast TV was Norman Lear. Dynamite! His shows were revolutionary challenging and ultimately changing the viewing culture. Lear's characters were deeply human and struggled in ways that are as relevant today as they were 40 years ago. Yeah, now I see what your idea of a free country is. You're free to say anything you want, but if, but if anyone disagrees with you, they're either thrown into jail or called a meathead, right? That's right, because this is American land that I love. <laughs> you see, I'm G-A-Y. <laughs> Good God, you're black. <laughs> Wrong with that? These characters were real to us. Like when we would go to go to school the next day, we talking about what happened on the show, and that influenced so much of the way we grew up, how we lived, and eventually it came out in the music and the culture and what, and what we thought. You thought the world was changing. There was a moment. There was a hope. There was a lot of hope in what you did. A World War II veteran of more than 50 bombing missions over Germany, Lear grew concerned in the early 1980s with what he saw as new forms of intolerance. He founded People for the American Way and produced a TV special celebrating a more diverse and inclusive brand of patriotism. I'm just a flag, a symbol. You're the people. If I may say so from here, long may you wave. His ongoing philanthropy includes purchasing one of the earliest copies of the Declaration of Independence and giving it back to the people through extensive touring. His nonpartisan Declare Yourself campaign registered more than four million new young voters. With a career that has yielded four Emmys, a Peabody Award, a National Medal of the Arts, there is little Norman Lear has not achieved. Now, at the age of 92, he's written his first book, his memoir, Even This I Get to Experience. Somebody wants to know, what's the one thing you know? The one thing I know at this moment is that I've had the best fucking time I could have. <laughs> there you go. That... <laughs> That's a hard one for me to, to follow. I'm going to ask a, a, a whoopee like question. I'm going to ask, why the boat hat? Some 50 years ago, I was writing 18 hours a day and picking my scalp. Mm. And, uh, and my wife at the time threw a, saw this uh, scar coming and going <laughs> through a little cap on my head, a, a boating hat like this on my head, and said, uh, you know, wear it. And uh, I, I fell in love with it. I never took it off. I sleep in this. Do you? I, I gotcha. shower in this. Oh, so you have some yeah. specially custom made then, I presume, and switch out. Yeah. OK. Well, now we know. So Norman, when you were creating these breakthrough shows, I mean, this, these were shows that happened in the, in the 70s on the heels of the popular shows like Bonanza, which was this picture-perfect family in the West. You had Bewitched, which was, you know, I mean, this magical perfection and, and little idiosyncrasies within families. But you chose 
to get out there and talk about things that were not talked about mm -hmm. and use humor but to bring it But they were talked about. They were talked about in the families where these problems existed. And so you so. wanted to just, what, bring a light into these different families and show them for as, as real as they may be and use humor to make it more palatable? I was uh, zeroing in on 50 or something when all of this happened. I've been doing other television before that. And uh, I was a grown man with children, and, uh, and I saw life around me. I'm a serious person. I understand the foolishness of the human condition. Uh, we make me laugh. And uh, so that's the way I see things, through the end of the telescope that reveals the comedy. But I'm serious, so we tackle the things around us. Uh, the shows you mentioned, if you think uh, the roast is ruined and the boss is coming to dinner is a serious problem, then you were looking at serious television. Mm. But, uh, you know, menopause, uh, child's failing grades, uh, you know, the, the problems, re uh, real problems in, in, in family life were far more attractive. What was the and the humor was there. And what was the most difficult sell to network executives? Which which things Getting did they on. say? Just well, <laughs> that, I think that's still the case today, correct? But yeah. in terms of the topics, I know there was one, wasn't it about impotence that they said to you, "We cannot go there oh, because well, it was meathead." They said that lots of yeah, times. Yeah, we're yeah. not going to go. There. And you yeah. said, "Well, okay, then I'm, then I'm out of here." And and you yeah. you just threw down the gauntlet and said, "We're doing it my way, or we're going to take the highway." Well, it's it was either a question. I have to say, I had a three-picture deal offered to me from United Artists. I made a film called Cold Turkey. They loved it. I loved it. Uh, and they offered me three films. So it was not hard to be, uh, you know, d display a little strength here. I had a three-picture deal I could go to. There was that. There was also uh, the question of submitting to stupid or silly. On the very first episode of All in the Family, Archie needed to come back from church early on a Sunday morning because uh, he hated the sermon <laughs> and the minister. And walk into the house when the kids are, it's their 25th wedding anniversary, they're planning a surprise brunch for them, but they're alone in the house and they run upstairs to make love. They come in and the kids, are, their plans are foiled, they come running down the stairs, Archie understands the moment, and he says, 11.10 of a Sunday morning. <laughs> Line had to come out. Now, we had had dozens of arguments about what else Archie was saying, racial epithets and so forth. And we were through all that. This was the last thing on the last day, hours before it was to be run in New York, and they were threatening to take out the line. And uh, I said, take out the line, I won't be here tomorrow. Now the question, and I said, why? Well, it makes everything graphic. I said, 11, 10, yes, it causes people to think. <laughs> well, on top, okay. of, on top of everything else, they're a, ma they're a young married couple. What's the problem? So I think it's easy to understand. That was just plain silly. If I gave in to that silly, I would be living with it forever. I mean, there's no way I wouldn't, every silly would try. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to say, do that, I won't turn up tomorrow morning. And it was like 20 minutes before I was leaving the office, because we were working on subsequent scripts, uh, to come home to see my show on television, <laughs> on the tube, when I got a call from New York it's saying within 20 minutes of it airing in New York, okay, you won this one. Hmm. Well, we're awfully glad you did and kept on winning. Um, another thing that you've done is become so well known and respected for your political activism, and particularly uh, through the group People for the American Way. Mm -hmm. And that is what will bring us, I think, closest to this intersection here with Prophet and his, uh, Prophet and his life, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But. What was it that made you want to use that platform as opposed to reaching the millions and the masses via television and sending a message that way? Well, we, I thought we were doing that with, with television. So you had but another this, challenge. But, uh, I, there's a kind of a through line in my life. 
I was, my father went to jail when I was a kid, when I was nine years old, and served three years. I was without him for three, in the course of that three years early on, uh, I discovered Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin was a priest uh, out of Dearborn, Michigan, and a uh, vicious anti-Semite, anti-New Deal, attracted by what he was hearing about what was happening in Germany. But anyway, I was nine years old, my father was away, and now I'm learning. There are people who hate me, uh, even wish me dead, because uh, I was born to Jewish parents, I'm Jewish. And, uh, but I love to talk about this because I love to say we had civics classes then. We learned who we were as Americans. We don't have civics in public schools today as we don't have the sufficient art programs and so forth. So I was helped to understand the blessings of America. The my First Amendment, my Bill of Rights, my guarantees. And in the course of that, too, I developed the empathy for the prophet walkers of my life. You know, people with other skin colors, other uh, ethnicities and so forth, who are also, and some of them by far more seriously than the, the, the Jewish people. Uh, and that became a kind of a through line. Uh, film referred to the purchase of the Declaration. I won a scholarship to the one year I went to college uh, speaking about the Constitution. The words uh, founding fathers are important to me because I didn't have a father for the years I needed mm -hmm. one. So, And uh, I've had a great time, by the way. I don't want to. <laughs> No, we heard I mean, you express it. it. You've, you've had the best it, <clears throat> time I mean, <laughs> in that. I look out at you and, and sitting here with you, and, and even this I get to experience. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about difficult times, but they were times I obviously needed to be for, as a springboard for everything else that followed. Yeah. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Prophet, you need to be. Um, he has become familiar to people in the highest echelons of government. He spent... Uh, a certain Tuesday night in January with the first family sitting to listen to the State of the Union address <laughs> given by President Obama. He was a guest of Michelle Obama's. And so they think he's important enough to talk to and listen to. And I want you to get a listen yourselves to a little bit of profit and about his life. So let's look at a video about that. Scene. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> Shall we dance? We could. Well, until that gets rolling, we will talk about Prophet because his life will be looked at from this video, I do believe. From the age of 16, a very pivotal thing happened, which you will see. Um, you have. To six years. Well, here it is. <laughs> I think. How about that? Until this goes, is it going, guys? Okay, until it gets going, how about this? I want to have you gentlemen talk about the first time you met, and then we'll hopefully get a little background on this. But how did you first meet Norman? And what was that like, by the way? So I, um, his son and I are, are close, Ben. And I, I asked Ben, like, I want to meet your dad. Heard so, much, so many great things about him. And then I get invited to meet him um, and said we're gonna have breakfast at his house and I went to his house and uh, it's probably the greatest view I've ever seen <laughs> 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 and uh, we sat at the table and had a, a very long uh, conversation where I just felt extremely connected to him and, and appreciative for all the work and so that was my first experience I thought it was a little kooky but incredible I was a little cooky, but incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. <laughs> so that's good. Um, it, it, I, I, I fell in. This is a, uh, a great public servant, and uh, but I mean, I mean, really solid, solid, solid. And as soon as I understood that, you know, there's so little of it in our world today, as far as from my point of view, 
so little of it. And, uh, and his background and, and, and his forward thinking is so solid. So. Well, the, the background, in, in lieu of this video, um, we'll just talk a little bit. It, you're probably the best to say it, but I'll get you launched. At 16, you were found guilty and tried as an adult uh, of assault, and you were with some friends, and you were sentenced to six years in prison, some of which you spent in a juvenile facility and, and others not. But the thing that I'm most impressed about that time, you had an inner voice saying to you, I am not a criminal. Right. I, I'm more than this, and you not only became more than this, you became really a beacon for hope. Right. And this is because you started studying while you were behind bars. Talk about that, your, your intersection with Scott Budnick, who mm -hmm. is the producer of the Hangover series, who had volunteered some time and was doing a writing program. He saw promise in you, and you guys took off to make it a better world for those that are behind bars. Right, yeah. Well, while I was inside, what I started to what I started to really see is that so many of the people incarcerated, um, the majority of them, I think about 70%, had a fourth grade reading level. Many of them uh, grew up in, in dire straits in different communities. Um, and the choices that they were given were very, very limited. And so I had, a, quite frankly, a foolish, somewhat naive idea that went against all best practices that said, look, if we just give a person a different choice, a different option, uh, particularly education, maybe they'll do something with it. Um, I, had, I had experienced, i say, about two and a half years on a maximum security prison, seeing the worst, dealing with the worst. Um, then I transferred to a lower level security prison, and I said, young people should not go through what I had just experienced. Instead, let's bring them here, give them an opportunity to get a degree, and see what happens. And it started with 30 people, and uh, thinks it, it serves about 7,000 today in California prisons, and about 200 have come home and attend four-year or two-year mm -hmm. universities. And like you did. You graduated from Loyola <laughs> Marymount two years ago with a degree in engineering, which is phenomenal. Um, and it's just, it spoke to what I felt was the intrinsic value of the human, which just said, like, we all want to do our very best at some level. We want to be our very best. We want our friends and our family to be proud of us. Um, but sometimes those options aren't always given to us. And to, you talk about your family. You have a daughter you had very young, and she's she's kind of been a guiding light for you, hasn't she? Yeah. 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 All right, well, let's, let's watch part of this because there's more to the story. Here it is. At the age of six, Prophet Walker was abandoned by his mother to grow up in the... <laughs> At the age of six, Prophet Walker was abandoned by his mother to grow up in the Nickerson Gardens project. But you don't get past six. Yeah, no. that's it. That's it. How'd you manage this? That's it. Is it 27 now? Yes. Okay. In a court, um, being tried as an adult for assault and great bodily injury. He was sentenced to six years in prison. I decided that I wasn't a criminal and this life wasn't for me. Education would be my way out of this. Walker enrolled in a creative writing class taught by Hollywood producer Scott Budnick. He wrote a, a proposal, sent it to the Department of Corrections, and himself was able to change the way that all kids are treated when they hit prison. When Prophet left the juvenile system and went to adult prison, he found a totally different world. And that's when Budnick and Walker had an idea. X coordinate is straight across a college program for young offenders so in adult prison. Now the program is spreading to prisons across the state. After his release, Walker gained a degree in engineering and committed himself to improving the lives of those in his old neighborhood. He organized an annual retreat called the Watts United Weekend. And it was a really simple concept of bringing kids from each of the rival housing projects, bringing their parents, teachers that cared, law enforcement, clergy, electeds, gang interventionists, and whoever was a part of this puzzle of making this community become whole. Prophet Walker had become a role model, a community leader. His next step seemed clear. I'm running for assembly because thousands of families have given up and I wanna give them hope. You have an obligation not only to yourselves, but to our children, to make sure that every single child 
can dream again. His campaign brought together backers from the community and from Hollywood. Politics, as usual, however, would also soon play a role. Well, tonight we got our hands on this controversial mailer, and you can see why it's kicking off a political firestorm. Here is candidate Mike Gibson depicting himself as a police officer, and over here is a very poorly photoshopped picture of his opponent who he's put into a hoodie, and he's holding a gun. When you take a man running for office and you Photoshop a hoodie on him and put a gun in his hands, you are violating the trust and faith and fairness of every American voter. Prophet Walker lost the election, but he succeeded in attracting the attention of the White House. As a guest of the First Lady, he attended this year's State of the Union address, another milestone in an ongoing story of redemption and promise. All of you gasp when we saw what was done, the just the incredible violation of, of ethics um, in that campaign. I did too. I get angry. My, my palms started sweating watching that again. It makes me so damn mad. And you don't seem to have anger about it, but you're not taking this lying down. And, and I know that there is, there is a lawsuit because of the violation of California um, political ethics, and, and we don't need to get into that. But the morning after the election, what was that like? Because you could almost single-handedly point to that and say, that did me in. I was like, thank God it's over. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, a grueling year and a half of no sleep and a lot of, just a lot of everything. So there was that moment of, of sense of relief, like, wow, it's over. And then there were, there were moments where I was, like, a little depressed about it all. I was like, wow, you know, I... I ran because I believed in the humanity and the ideas of our, our democracy. Um, and I experienced that very clearly, as, as normally, Norman articulated, being taken away. Um, and so that, that bugged me for quite a bit, but uh, you know, well, it, it turned out for the better. Did anybody think that was a suable act? That, that was against the law to do that? It, you, you know what's funny is, um, and I can only, there's now a lawsuit there, but uh, when we first saw it, we knew for a fact. Uh, my attorney sent out a cease and desist immediately. We knew for a fact it was completely against the law. Um, but the law is, is very difficult to prove libel because of the intent of malice and all this other stuff. Um, long story short, uh, his camp, people in his own campaign decided to step up and say, hey, this was wrong, and we're here to support you. Because it, yeah. It, oh, it that's did. great. Yeah. That's the first encouraging thing I've heard in days. <laughs> 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 but, you know, something that we talked about, we had a conference call be before um, we all met here, and we talked about touching on the touchy issue of race, not only race in politics, but race in general and inequity and why it is that the color blindness has not um, permeated all facets of society. And in this one in particular, this instance where it was a black man against another black man and there, you know, it's almost like the brotherhood code was so deeply violated by that. Did people comment on that? Well, I, <coughs> So when it happened, I actually was impacted mostly because of the young black men in the community we were seeking to serve, right? We've all seen during the 80s, the 70s, the, all the images of black men in hoods, and we were taught to fear young black and brown men, and we see the repercussions of that play out today. Um, and so when I initially saw that, I was horrified for the many kids who I had taken my story and said, hey, no matter what, you can actually succeed. And then someone took it back and said, actually, no, you can't. Hmm. Um, and so that, that really, really tore me up inside for the, for the young people um, in that community. And it was, you know, it was Willie Horton committed by a black man. It was, hmm. it was, it was very, very difficult to understand. And, but I think that spoke larger in some cases to how, and Norman speaks about this a lot, of, about how where America's going and how sometimes the pursuit of power outweighs um, our greatest ideals. And, and you know, I, 
I talked about this a lot. I can't tell you whether or not Mike Gibson, my opponent, was a good or a bad man. I, I didn't know him well enough, but I do know he made a bad decision during the pursuit of power. Um, and it, it speaks to, I think it speaks volumes to the overall democracy, right? It's, it's, it's such the, one of the clearest examples of that kind of uh, thievery. I mean, mm. it's the worst. Yeah. Right. What do you, Norman, think it is? What is the, if you can think of the main reason why racism persists? I mean, yes, obvious reasons that people look different, but but it's, when you looked at your show, uh, the Jeffersons, San Francisco, all these different shows that you, you put all this out there and people talked about it and laughed about it, and then you see 30, 40 years later what's happening. Why have we not progressed any further? I think because we haven't had uh, the kind of leadership that uh, that calls for an honest discussion of who we are as Don't human beings and what that, we though? feel. Huh? With, when, when President Obama was elected, I remember watching him in Chicago, in Grants Park, and, and, and I, I wept, as many people did around this country, because we thought, look what's just happened. By the event. But, but I don't think he's, he's helped us conduct a conversation about race at all, nor has anybody. I wasn't looking to the president necessarily. I also looked to the media. You know, what does the media, this is a, a government that, that requires an informed citizenry. That's, it's built on an informed citizenry. Do you think yelling at each other on talk shows is a way of informing us? Bumper sticker news items without context informs us? I, I think that we are not, we're leaderless. Hmm. And I say that as a proud, bleeding heart conservative. <laughs> Wait a minute, that wasn't my research. Um, so we're looking to get leaders and someone like Prophet, I mean, it's frustrating they didn't get this particular assembly seat. Are you thinking about running again? Have you thought about politics again or was, did that taint your? No, no, it didn't taint at all. At some point, I will for sure uh, run again. I still, when I, when I decided to run, or when I decided to run for office, um, I wrote this 10-page letter to family and friends based on why I wanted to run. Um, it was very, what I thought to be very principled, grounded, and in the beliefs of what I could do for that community. Those things still stand to this day. Um, it's now a matter of timing. I've decided uh, to go on and also pursue my career as a uh, real estate developer and, and you know, be able to help build we have a huge housing crisis here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and be able to help build uh, great housing that will also be affordable for people is another way I'll continue my civic duty for that community and hopefully be an inspiration. And at some point, I completely intend to, to run again and, and hopefully um, bring some light to mm -hmm. the system. Can I, can I just say, here's what I mean by honest discussion. My oldest daughter was... 15 or 14 or something like that. She raved about an art teacher that she had. For months I heard about this teacher. And then there was an evening when the parents came to school and I met the teacher. And I was so surprised that she was black. Hmm. Because my daughter never mentioned it. And I was aware, in my generation, we think about that. Yeah. I can't be with a black person without understanding. He's, I can't be with Gentiles who like me, who are not, who don't make me feel better than another Jew who might like me. I'm trapped, in a sense, in, in, in the boy I was, who was early frightened. You know, I'm past, I, I'm understanding it, so I live with it, you know, but it's there. I mm -hmm. cannot lose it. And, uh, but my kids and their attitudes, they're free of that. With all I've done with it, you know, to, to make amends <laughs> for that, the fact is I'm much more aware than my children are. And that's the way I think, if I'm right or wrong about that, it doesn't matter. It's a conversation that wants to take place. But see, we all I, have these mm -hmm. feelings one way or the other. I applaud you because I would say your 15-year-old daughter is that way because it starts at home. I think a lot of this starts at home. I'm, I'm going to tell you, my son is here. I, I brought him because I wanted him to hear this conversation, and I would love to think that he would have a similar mm -hmm. reaction to your daughter. I mean, it starts at home with so many things. Your home life as a child 
what's amazing about what you've done is how you you rose above your mother she she left the picture when you right. were six years old mm -hmm. um, drugs heroin did her in your father did his best but you grew up wasn't it Nickerson Garden is that mm -hmm. where you grew up which is a, you know rather infamous level of the Watts area or community right. that it, it's pretty darn tough what I love about the Watts United weekend is it's a weekend where he takes kids up into is it the Angeles National Forest up there right. and you're taking kids from rival gangs teachers counselors parents community influencers police law enforcement because that's a whole nother thing we can talk about you take all these people up there from these various groups and these are kids who would normally want to punch each other out if they saw each other in school because they're from rival gangs and they cry when they leave the weekend they're hugging each other because they've gotten to talk to each other and listen to each other how powerful do you think this weekend is and can it be expanded because you do it quarterly is it we do it quarterly I'd love to expand it it can be expanded it's just a matter of obviously resources but it's <clears throat> it's extremely powerful and I and I'll take this back to when I was in prison so I spent about nine months at one point inside solitary confinement nine months straight and that was a moment where I began to realize how incredibly powerful it would be for me to hold on to my own personal dreams. In fact, all I had in that cell was memories of the past and dreams of the future. And I had to combine those to make sure I remained sane. Um, and then I, I started realizing that a lot of children um, were being stripped of their ability to just simply dream. And you know, in, in, in Norman's book, I think, which really just touched me, I remember reading it, to think about a day and a half, it was really bad, I was like just binge reading, <laughs> um, <laughs> neglected relationships and everything. And, but what was really incredible about the book, it shows this, this spirit of a dreamer. If you read his book, it's a spirit of a dreamer of someone who refuses to give up under any circumstances. And so many kids just cannot even imagine this idea of, of being successful, imagine an idea of a dream that's greater than the, the housing projects that they exist in. And so um, back to when I was in prison, I remember one moment, I went to camp one time in my life when I was uh, 13, I believe. And I remember writing uh, to my daughter uh, a, a letter but it was titled, The Beautiful Sting of a Bee. And I wrote this whole letter about how it was so beautiful for me to be stung by a bee in summer camp. And I remembered that moment, and I remembered every single smell, every single idea, and it transformed into me thinking about what I wanted to do for the future. And so a lot of these young people who get the, the chance to dream, like Norman wrote incredible, incredible stories as a dreamer. And, when you when you allow a child to develop their dreams, they I think they'll be much more successful. And so, mm. I believe the camp is impactful because of that reason. Yeah, I love. I mean, I, when you talk about nine months in solitary, yeah, and all you had were the memories and the dreams. That is so. Yesterday, I saw Anna Devere Smith read and do this piece on. Uh, on Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. And when she referred to one line where he asks, he, he wrote it to other uh, uh, pastors, white ones, and he asked them, can you imagine having to explain to a five-year-old five why a sign says that the black child cannot go in there, the playground? why the black child cannot go in the player. I was extremely touched by that memory, and then I'll never forget your saying this here this morning, because that's just the most incredible image. Why, why Prophet? I mean, other than things that he's saying today, but what was it about Prophet when you crossed paths that you thought, this is a guy to back, this is a guy that's going places, or this is a guy who can who can be a mouthpiece and who can inspire others and make a difference. Well, you hear, I mean, I, I don't remember that specific line, but you hear a man who says, I'm nine months in solitary and all I had were uh, memories of a terrible past 
and dreams of a glorious future. Wouldn't you want to spread that as wide as you could? How yeah. much better off would we all be if we owned life in that fashion? I think also in his book he talks about he judges people based on their hugs. Whether you have a, <laughs> whether you have a, a, a slopping wet hug no, or I've a dry always, hug. I've always uh, divided people into wets and dries. Ah. And I, I, think, I think I was a, a kid walking out of an Ingrid Bergman picture <laughs> when, I, when it first occurred to me. Dry people are flaky. They don't hug well. You could cut yourself on their bodies. Mm. And wet people are warm and moist and tender, and they hug well. OK, I know the kind of hug when I say goodbye to you that I'll be giving you. Um, so, so this, getting it down right now. Um, so the book, I mean, he's, he's read it. He keeps talking about the inspiring things. And yet I understand this book, you had to sit on this thing for like 20 years and percolate well, as to how you wanted to tell this story. That it wasn't easy for you, despite you being, you know, the most prolific well, storyteller in television Well, it isn't easy to terms. be a human being. Let's start there. Well, there's that, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard to be a human being. What were you afraid of, of it? Was it was it having to get inside? No, no, inside no. I, I I told myself uh, 20 years before I started it that I would write a book, and I made notes. And I everybody around me that worked with me uh, knew this was going to happen, and so I had the greatest help in the world collecting things and keeping things and filing things in ways that would eventually be very helpful. And, uh, and then at a certain time, I said, no. Mm -hmm. And I started to write. And I, it took a little more than five years. Mm -hmm. but, well, the, but the other part was my deciding. I, I decided to do it. I just waited for the time. <laughs> Well, it's a good time to do it now. Uh, I'm not sure about our time. I know you, some of you may have some questions. I'm, and, and if you do have them, I'd love to open this up to Prophet and to Norman. Um, anyone have anything you'd like? I mean, I can keep talking forever. But yes, you, you go ahead. How did Ben get into the process of Oh, good point. So uh, ben, ben Lear is going to be an incredible, or he is an incredible uh, filmmaker and storyteller himself. He's currently telling a story about our juvenile justice system and uh, he's done a, a, a tremendous amount of work in the juvenile halls following kids in fact he gave children within the juvenile hall an opportunity to actually become screenwriters so the children inside the juvenile hall are writing their story while he's filming them write their story it's a phenomenal phenomenal thing and a it's edited now, and he's. It's, yeah, and it's I, on I way. spoke at the at NATB, National Association of Television Production Executives, and a fellow walked up to me and threw out his hand. He said, "I'm John Murray of Bunim Murray. I just bought your son's uh, documentary for distribution." And you gave him a wet so, hug, right? So <laughs> I, gave, <laughs> I gave him a wet hug. Yeah. Yeah. That's so phenomenal. it's on its way. Well, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. They gave me the mic. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> right. oh yes. Okay, there. Sorry about that. I just want to say I'm very, very proud of Prophet Walker. I was the first elected official to endorse him. I just want to ask something of you in front of everybody. Please allow me to be the first one to endorse you next time. I okay. love it. I and love who it. are you? Say who you are so we can applaud that. I, I'm a congressman that I represent the San Fernando Valley. Fantastic. Uh, and it's not popular for elected officials to endorse people who have a felony record. Uh, and th and that's, that's sad. Uh, we should be endorsing people and supporting people based on who they are, not based on something that may have happened. Uh, that, Amen. That's not who they are. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, I just wanted to say I've been so blessed to, to listen to Norman Lear. I was at the Kennedy Center uh, and so glad I went. You changed me. Oh, I'm glad you, you were there. You got that award recently in Washington, D.C. Y'all should Google it or whatever kids do these days. Uh, <laughs> listen, it, it, is, it is so real and so beautiful because, like today, you're talking like a human being, not like a white man, not like a Jewish man. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking like a human being that we all should try to aspire to, to be like, not just talk like. Uh, but thank, um, thank my, you. My, thank you. My, I, I'm sorry I had to say that. Uh, I don't get a chance to, to <laughs> say hello to you personally. Um, but I just want to say uh, juvenile justice. Uh, it, what, are you, what are you doing, Prophet, when it comes to juvenile justice? And you mentioned what Norman Lear is doing, visiting the young people is awesome. But what do you see is what we can do, we can do, uh, as in not elected officials like me, but we, the people in this room, Americans, uh, citizens, to be able to help 
uh, nurture and create a better environment for our kids other than the one the juvenile justice system that we have today right I I think just in general what we could all do um, in our own personal lives with our own children uh, tell them how much you love them and how great they are um, and when we have an opportunity to mentor and be a part of other young people's lives um, telling those children how great and incredible they are. I remember in prison, I remember I had incredible low self-esteem. So I spent four, four and a half years every single day waking up, looking in a mirror, telling myself that I was great until I figured out that I could have self-esteem. But so many children lack the self-esteem and it, it requires us to love. Um, so that's on that end. The other, within the, the juvenile justice system, I think it, it needs to be a, a nonpartisan issue. It's our babies who are, who are being lost right now. It's, uh, it's our economy that's being destroyed by just a ridiculous, expensive justice system. Um, and it's also our, our economy that's being feathered away through our um, intellectual uh, currency that we lose every single day. Um, so certainly making sure you know, in, in Congress and in other places, we come together on this issue. Myself and Scott Budnick actually recently created a um, political action committee um, specifically to, tar to target issues of justice reform, um, to see how we can push the envelope forward, to, to see children sentenced um, justly and thought of as children and, and a resource, a part of our country. So. Fantastic. <clears throat> I, I want to thank Norman Lear, I just got back from Hartford this morning, and you're a, a national treasure, but also a local treasure. And Prophet, I wanted to ask you when you're writing your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly enough, I've, I've been thinking about that with a few people, but haven't completely decided yet, but soon, I suppose. Let's go to this side of the room. Quick question for Norman. I read the book, loved it. When did you, the philosophy of even this I got to experience, was that later in your life or as you were going through some of these tough things, whether it was you know, three divorces or you're losing your money, when did you get that piece of saying that life's like a river, if you will, even this I get to experience, that kind of gave you that, that peace of soul? I, it's, I've thought that way in uh, you know, a great many years, I don't know. Uh, because extraordinary things have happened in my life. I wonder all the time whether it, it, it wasn't that I, and I overlooked them for a lot of years. Wait a minute, how did this come to pass? The first night I was in Los Angeles, I was here with a wife and, and a small baby. They were parked in a motel. I was driving, I saw my favorite play in the world opening in a 90-seat theater, uh, a, a short play, uh, and I'm trying to make a long story very short. I went. I got inside because I, the guy sweeping up was the producer of the thing. It was again a tiny place like this, and the and and, and the action took place here. Three seats were. He asked me if I wanted to come in. He was fascinated that I had a wife and kids in a motel. I had to call my wife to tell her I was going to see a, th a show. I was out to get a Sunday newspaper on Saturday evening. <laughs> <laughs> to look for a place to live the next day. We had only just driven from Hartford. And uh, anyway, I called my wife. This was kismet. I just had to see this play. It was my favorite piece of literature. I walked in. I sat down. I, again, I repeat, 90, the 90 seats. Three seats are taped off in front of me. The lights go down. And in walks Alan Mowbray, a very well-known British actor, I forget her name, Dame, somebody, glorious British actress, and Charles Chaplin. I, I'm sitting beside Charles Chaplin watching my favorite piece of theater. There is no backstage when it's over, so the actors come out and they sit on the floor in front of Mr. Chaplin. The, those of us behind him are not going to get up so long as he's sitting there. So we're all sitting there, and he gets up and he thanks them. They're on their you know, sitting on the floor, thanks them for the uh, performance, uh, and uh, turns to us and says, I never feel satisfied just saying thank you when I enjoy something as much as this unless I do something for them. 
So excuse me as if we need to be excused. <laughs> and then he performs for them, an inebriated guy over here seeking to mail a, an envelope over there in a, in a high wind. Oh, my and gosh. It was, and the, this is the first several hours that I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> my life has just been full of incidental wonder. <laughs> yeah. Reasons for which this is going to be, it is a bestseller. That, I mean, stories like that is why we're all going to be picking that up to get ready to sign afterwards. Yes. Uh, um, this is for Prophet and Norman. Uh, Norman, uh, uh, Neil Crone, I produce and direct political advertising, and uh, I have to apologize for the behavior of some of my colleagues in Prophet's campaign. Uh, the question is, you're, a f uh, Norman, a free speech advocate as well as somebody that is very involved in politics. Uh, how do you protect the public? Uh, w w how do we bridge, bridge free speech from, from, from slanderous advertising? Uh, and we're going to see it in this next presidential campaign. It's already started. Um, wh what, what can we do about this, uh, in your opinion? Well, that's why I asked Prophet if there isn't a lawsuit. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's over and it's, you know, it, what matters is the guy did that and it had to have had an enormous effect right. and spent money, you know, and, and the papers picked it up. I mean, uh, I, th I look at it as one of the most heinous political ac acts I've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how to answer the question except to go after this kind of thing. Money in politics, what are we going to do about all the money in politics? Oh, can, it would, let me ask you a question as somebody who works in this field. I have the crazy idea. I, I, I think it would work if uh, Elizabeth Warren were running. And uh, and maybe it could with Hillary. Well, to to say I am not going to spend a nickel on political advertising. I will need help in funding so I can move around the country adequately, and uh, and that's as much as I will not spend a nickel. Unfor they, yeah, unfortunately. And, and yeah. I think it. My sense is it would make the kind of impact. The media would be following yeah. her, and she'd get the message across like nobody's mm -hmm. business. Well, I think if the politi political action committees would go away, that would be possible. But with all of those, you, you can't prevent Oh, I don't think it can in. be done because nobody, it's everybody impossible. thinks yeah, I'm an unless, asshole. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> and unless government pays and, uh, for the, the top candidates uh, and, and limits the amount they spend, this is going to keep going on, and, and uh -huh. it's just more and more money. Um, and the 30-second ads, the slate mailers, and especially in, in small elections, it's those slate mailers and, and, and the, uh, and, and the uh, paper that comes into your mailbox that still plays uh, the biggest right. part in, in, in beating somebody like Profit, who should have won that election, in my opinion. Yeah. What if? Well, I think what's going to be interesting, this just comes to mind as I talk about the what ifs. And I, I, Jeb Bush has said, even though he's not an officially declared candidate, OK. But he has said that throughout this campaign, he does not want to get into the mud, doesn't want to get into the dirt. Um, perhaps it's based on the fact that he's had a very authentic friendship with Marco Rubio, who has declared his candidacy, and you know he will it be going dirt. up against him. And, and they're friends. And he said, look, I'm not going to, um, to, to get into the slanderous and, and libelous and, and dirty talk. I'm very curious to see how long that lasts. And mm -hmm. if, by example, he does that, he could perhaps elevate, raise a little bit the discourse in, in politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a, another sort of, between the money in politics and the horrible things that are said, implied, and for people like you that, you know, ought to have been elected and are victimized by that, we'll see. I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. on a, as an aside, I'm curious to see how long that lasts. Um, do you need the microphone? Yeah. This is a question for both. With the failure of the fourth estate, what do you feel the responsibility of the media is today? Robert? The failure of, I didn't, I didn't hear The fourth that. estate? I'm actually not familiar with that one. Fourth What's estate the where the press should absolutely be truthful oh. and responsible in reporting the facts? <sighs> well, <clears throat> I think the one of the most difficult things there is like, 
we want to protect our you know our free speech here um, and the informed citizenry is a big deal um, I, th I think the more we we look at the sort of political atmosphere um, and I hope even what I do with my lawsuit will be an attempt to I guess bring that back to the forefront to say actually um, there's real consequences if you lie to the citizenry because you take away our actual rights um, when when you do so. So I, I think that that's that's one way that I can I can be helpful personally, and I hope that other people because I mine caught a lot of attention, but these type of things actually happen quite frequently, particularly in the political space. A lot of slanderous, libelous things that happen um, that you know, get overlooked uh, quite often. And then I think that ushers in also with our media that begins to uh, just say all types of crazy things. Quite frankly, our audiences, a lot of young people prefer the, you know, the slanderous and what can I read really quickly. Um, and that's, that's an issue uh, that I think may be a little bit cult or generational also, is how do we get they, past. They've been taught that. Yeah. They, they grew up learning. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that Andy Warhol defined an entire century saying that, uh, you know, everybody will be looking for their 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. And celebrity is, is all. Yeah. And the fourth estate honors celebrity uh, I mean, who in our who in America is more important than uh, than Kim Kardashian and uh, what's his Bruce Jenner and that story? I mean, my God, it, it occupies more space than ISIS or Syria. Or, uh, you know I think we're t entirely let down. The American people in their emotionally crowded lives are totally let down by the fourth estate. Do you think that is a, a part of the, the celebrity nature? Do you think that's a part of lack of good education? Or sometimes I even blame all this on the internet and the immediacy with which we have to have our answers and look for things. And, and this 15 minutes of fame has become, I mean, so the normal discourse of every day. People are looking for it, whether it's they put out some outrageous tweet from you know the middle of their home in Des Moines, sitting in their underwear, and we're all paying attention to it. It makes me crazy. But do you think, <laughs> I think it's you're answering your question? Well, I know, yeah, and I don't actually do that on my show. Just FYI. Um, and, and, I, and I will say one thing: being part of the Fourth Estate, um, I, I will say that my colleagues, those that I respect and that I am proud to call my colleagues, we all do our darndest to give the truth and tell, you know, as best we can. It sometimes is how we're getting our information is a problem. And I also look back to the time at which journalism became something a for-profit industry. I think that's when it changed. Because in the days of old, in the Walter Cronkite days and, and, and all of that, um, it was a huge money just pit. But it was OK because the networks and the businesses said, look, we have a greater good, we have a responsibility. Once it began, began to be monetized, I think that's when the immediacy and being first on the scene and then sometimes not getting it right and, and then just the fallout from all that, I think that's when things changed. Well, that, that's what you're talking about is where I began. Broadcasting was not a profit center. First of all, they were broadcasters. The newscast the pay, the, wasn't for profit. And the, and the newscasts were not for profit. Right. They were not profit centers. We actually we existed because a, of people like you. Because you made so much money for the entertainment divisions that you know the networks could say, all right, well, we're going to siphon off from, from the success well, of Well, But it was an attitude that went into it with. There was a sense of responsibility as a broadcaster to the people. And that sense of responsibility turned to be out to be a sense of responsibility to shareholders. And now we live in a corporate culture in which uh, a, a corporate any corporation has to deliver a profit statement this quarter larger than the last mm -hmm. at the expense, of course, of any other value. Yeah. I mean, it's mm -hmm. amazing. And there's nothing in nature that would suggest anything can grow forever. And yet a corporation must in America deliver a profit statement this quarter larger than the last at the risk of being considered failing. It's insanity. Yeah. Question? What time is it? I know we have to leave time for people who want to buy your book. I turned my phone it's off. It's quarter of 12.
quarter but of 12. Do we're they have their lifetimes to buy the book? No, but they want to do it today, Norman. <laughs> um, we, okay, one more question here. So what? Watch United Weekend. What can you do to help with Watch United Weekend? It costs. It, it's a again a resource, and I'll pitch it. It's uh, costs about thirty five thousand dollars. I'm partnered, by the way, with the Harold Robinson Foundation, which is this incredible, incredible camp that brings uh, yeah, elementary school kids up to camp during the off season every single weekend. Um, it's just every other. Four weekends out of the year, we do Watch United. Um, it costs about $50,000 a weekend to bring everyone, officers, police. Um, so you can sponsor a weekend, sponsor part of a weekend. Um, that's that's the best way to help. Website? Do you yeah, at Harold Robinson. If you actually go to Harold, Rob Harold Robinson Foundation .org, uh, there's a separate link, which is Watch United, where you can... Uh, see videos about it, read about it, as well as be supportive. Well, um, this is our future. Yeah. This yeah. man, everything he's thinking and talking about. Thank you. Um, we'd, we'd have to wrap up. We're actually over. Um, but I just want to get a final thought. What's next for you, Norman? Because there's got to be something next for you. You're not a guy who just sits back and Lunch. rests on your roses. Lunch. <laughs> After the book signing. And you, Prophet? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Uh, I, I suppose lunch as well. Um, I'm I'm now actually working to uh, do commercial real estate development deals. Um, working on a hotel. Still in touch with Paul. I, I connected with Paul as well, and and yeah. uh, actually Dan Zeroni in the crowd is one of my partners, um, and we're working on doing different different deals, whether it's mixed use housing or apartments and. Uh, a lot of good deals and and hopefully run again at some point for sure so and well lunch. and, and you, lunch. You, you have been wonderful I've been oh really you're kind excited. thank, thank you. you well i appreciate no, 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 no. that thank, thank you, you. so um all of you keep in mind again um you can go to the pavilion and that's where norman is going to stick around uh and then he will have lunch um and sign <laughs> your the books that you will buy so thank you so much awesome, awesome. Yeah. 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 Yeah.